Excellent. Scott, I am so glad to be talking you, to you today. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for making some time. I have been looking forward to this on my calendar for many weeks, my friend. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, we, we have. It seems like we've had many conversations leading up to this one, and, uh, and I've been looking forward to get it on record, if you will. So for those of you who are tuning in uh, to this video. Uh, my name is Jim Williams, and I am delighted to be speaking today with Scott Brinker as part of our Marketing Acceleration Series. That's, uh, that's brought to you by Uptempo. It's basically a series of conversations where I talk to marketing operations experts and influencers and observers and you know, pretty much anyone has a thought about the marketing operations world. And so that's why uh, I'm really looking forward to this one, Scott. Awesome. Uh, you, you've got quite the long history of uh, leadership uh, in the marketing operations world, too. So, uh, yeah, many of our chats tend to uh, dig right into this. So definitely looking forward to it. <laughs> That's true. I have been around a long time. So, Scott Brinker, if uh, for some reason people don't know you out there, of course, Scott is currently the vice president of the platform ecosystem at HubSpot, where he does magnificent work. But he's best known for, I think, the editor at Chief Martech, which is just a steady stream of observations on the world of MarTech. And of course, uh, a big part of that history is the publishing, what, every year, every two years of the MarTech landscape, which has grown exponentially over the years. Yeah, it's like some sort of Dickens story of like, you know, the best of times and the worst of times, um, you know, that, that, that landscape of all these different marketing technology solutions. I don't know if it's the most loved or most hated uh, graphic in the marketing world, probably potentially somewhere between the two. Um, but yeah, it's just amazing to watch how this field, you know, has exploded over these past few years. And I think one of the comments I, I, I feel about it is, we all know that marketing has been going through crazy cataclysmic changes over the past 10 years. I mean, just the scope of what marketers are responsible for doing has, you know, expanded exponentially, but it's often very hard to quantify, you know, just how significant all this change has been for us. And I think the one thing about the landscape is, you know, it's by no means, you know, the centerpiece of change. It's, it's just a small yeah. piece of it. But at least it's one sort of like tangible artifact that you can look at and you can say, well, just the technology component of marketing, look how much it's changed in the past right. 10 years. You can imagine everything else we do about our organizations around that, you know, has been at least, you know, as significant. As much. Uh, so. yeah. as much of a change, right? I think, I think that's a really good point, right? Didn't it start at 150 vendors and you're now what, tracking close to 10,000 or something along, along those lines? Yeah, I mean, we're Would talking you... two orders of magnitude. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, but, but I think it's a really good point that just the number of vendors itself, it doesn't speak to the profound change, right? The, the change in your way of life as a marketer and the things that you do, what you're responsible for, what you track, what you measure, how you, how you operate. Is, is so much more vastly changed than just the number of MarTech vendors that there are in the landscape. Like the whole profession has been radically transformed. Which yeah. I think is really interesting. So you see that much change just in the landscape. You're like, wow. Now you start to like really appreciate why uh, marketing has become definitely an Olympic sport. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's talk a little bit about the state of MarTech. I know this is, this is a prior conversation we've had and I wanted to bring it up here because um, you know we kind of were speculating, and you've been asked in the past about it, is is it consolidating Martech or is it continuing to diversify, or is that just a natural ebb and flow that occurs? Yeah, I mean the 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 head twisting uh, answer to that is uh, both. Um, you know, I mean, you know, we certainly see consolidation in the MarTech industry in the sense that, you know, within different categories and different platforms, you know, there are leaders, uh, you know, that emerge in these categories. Um, there are now public companies, uh, you know, that you can look at and say, okay, these are kind of, you know, the 800 pound gorillas, you know, there are companies that are, you know, accelerating towards, you know, uh, going public in the, you know, and so you're like, yes, we see consolidation. We see those companies make acquisitions. I think you might be able 
we'll chat a little bit about some of the recent acquisitions that you've personally been involved with on this. Um, but we see that consolidation. However, at the same time, you know, because there are no barriers to the software industry anymore, in fact, quite the opposite, you know, through all these like cloud platforms, AWS and Google Cloud and Azure and, you know, open source, I just, you know, the, the wherewithal for people to create software, um, you know, is incredible, um, you know, and so even while we see consolidation moving up to the head, you know, of that long tail of all these MarTech apps, you know, we continually see this renewal of like new startups in the space, whether they're, focused on some particular niche, like a lot of MarTech companies aren't aiming to become like the multi-billion dollar juggernaut, you know, but right. they're serving a particular niche in a particular way that uh, is phenomenal. But then you have other startups that, yeah, they're looking to be the next wave of disruptors and some of them actually will be, you know. And so I think one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, that consolidation and diversification, the way you described it, I thought was the best I've actually heard anyone uh, describe it. it is kind of like an ebb and flow you know, of just how technology evolves today. Right, right, because there's also just the reality that um, a lot of people want to change the world and then a lot of people actually want to build a business. All great businesses get sold one way or another. Either it's the public buying it or it's another company buying it or whatever. Then they sell and then immediately go and start another business and their co-founder starts another business and the VP they brought in goes and starts a business to address them. So you just have this, you know, one company combines with another and then what six spawn from that or something like that you keep seeing that over and over again in this space i think um, part of it is just yeah again speaking to like you know it's not about the technology per se it's mm -hmm. about the fact that again just the behaviors you know of buyers and the dynamics between buyers and sellers and markets whether it's in the consumer space or in b2b like the world is just continuing to evolve you know and as it evolves rapidly and you know expectations change and channels change and capabilities change um you know marketers have to adapt uh, we have to serve the customer where they are um and so as long as there continues to be that just larger force of change in the world um there's always new opportunities uh you know from our tech startups to say like oh and here's a new piece uh, you know of that equation we can deliver right right um, it makes total sense. You know, the other thing we were talking about, which is related to this whole MarTech landscape, is that I think the considerable job that you do to try and group innovative companies together into a quote unquote category, product category, market category, whatever category you want, which it looks like it's a big job just from just scanning over the <laughs> landscape. So, do you see the same thing? Are categories getting bigger or do they like, you know, they? They like the amoebas, you know, they kind of get to a certain size and they split and then they split and then they split. How difficult is it to categorize vendors um, into the number of categories continue to, to multiply? <laughs> Next to impossible. Um, you know, I, I always say like uh, categorization um, sucks. The only thing that, you know, sucks more than categorization is no categorization. Uh, and it's true because, you know, in many ways, categorization at some level, it's almost like an analyst game. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. we're looking at this whole industry and we're just trying to make some sense of it. So we have to create boxes and we put things in boxes to- Jerry, you know, Gerrymandering, is that what they call yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> kind of actually. I've never heard anyone use that phrase, but it, it, I think actually that's a very analogous way of looking mm -hmm. at it. Um, but the truth is, you know, and I really believe this very strongly, um, you know, what matters for any given MarTech product is, is it addressing the needs of its customers? Is it solving the pain points that they have? And those pain points don't always fit, or even the solution, the creative solution, doesn't always fit in one of those, you know, nice, neat analyst boxes. So I always, I always take categorization with a really massive grain of salt. That being said, I think you know there is some reality to categorization, even for you know customers, even for the marketers who are buying this stuff, in the sense that they need a name in order to search for what they're looking for. Like, you know, the problems they have, you know, if they just type up all those problems and throw it in the Google search box, you know, uh, they might get some interesting content, but yeah, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, not the fastest path, <laughs> you know, but if they yeah. know a name, if there's some sort of category where they're like, oh, this category is generally the thing people have been trying to use to solve this problem, 
then they can type that into a search box and then they can start to find um, uh, who those folks are. So on, on the category front, it, it, I can I empathize with you how difficult it is, especially when I always think that you probably hear from a lot of vendors that don't like the box they're being stuck in, you know, that kind of analyst curse role. But in general, uh, with this category, there's also, as part of that, this obsession, I believe, with the, the notion of category creation um, in tech in general, but especially yeah. in MarTech. Every founder wants to be the category creator because, you know, there's this general thought that whoever creates the category dominates, which I'm not sure is entirely true, um, which seems kind of, it seems kind of odd because, you know, this constant creation of categories just splinters and splinters and splinters and it and exacerbates the buying problem that, that you talk to, you know, like you don't know which category is. You walk into the grocery store, you know, you kind of know the aisle you're looking for, mm -hmm. you might not know where in the aisle. And now it's like every product wants to have its own aisle. It gets, gets to be really challenging. Yeah, I mean, again, there's there's the the seller side and the buyer side, you know. And I think yes, the incentives on the seller side is if you can pull off category creation, um, yeah, there generally tends to be like very strong economic uh, benefit to that. Um, but that being said, I I also think there's potential benefit. I mean, for for buyers, it is a mixed bag, right? Like if there's too much category creation happening or or attempting to happen it just becomes confusing for them because they can't find what they're looking for. On the other hand, the truth is we are facing new problems and we are discovering new and better solutions to the problems we have. Mm -hmm. And we need names for what that right. new solution to you know those problems are. And so I think when a category does start to get created, it's because it really resonates with the buyers that they're like, yes, that label speaks exactly, you know, to what I am trying to solve to, um, you know, so it's, uh, I, I think it's a good thing for everyone to, to push uh, in that direction. But I also think, yeah, as you wisely yeah. noted, it's, it is a challenge uh, <laughs> to yeah. uh, successfully execute. For sure. Well, look, let's put a, let's put a pin in that naming of the problem we solved because I want to come back to you and have a discussion about that. But first, I just want to turn to something I found really, really fascinating when you did the, the state of the MarTech report, you know, it's part of your MarTech day, and then some of the derivative observations you had. And I, I couldn't help but note that out of all of these categories and all of the very popular products within them, products that I've spent the last two decades trying to put into my own stack and sometimes evangelize, you know, what, what comes to the top of the list for the most popular MarTech tool of all is, uh, is Excel, Microsoft Excel, <laughs> which is just, it's, it's shocking. Uh, sometimes a little comforting. <laughs> um, and I, I found that really surprising because as you know, you talked about the merging companies, right? Uptempo is the merger of, of three MarTech providers, uh, brand maker, Allocate and Hive9, all of which uh, provide marketing operations software or marketing resource management software, the software that you use to run the business of marketing and, and the number one competitor we run into and the number one competitor we probably lose to the most, spreadsheets, spreadsheets. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's both surprising and not surprising. It's like uh, surprising, like, you know, for those of us who spend, you know, so much of our time thinking about, you know, the tech stack and its evolution and, you know, what are the, you know, sort of the state of the art uh, capabilities that we can bring to bear, uh, you know, um, yeah, sort of like, wait, Excel, that thing from the 80s, um, you know, it's a bit surprising. But then on the other hand, for anyone who actually is, you know, in marketing, you're like, yeah, now that you mentioned, I do spend a lot of my time in Excel or Google Sheets. Uh, sure. You know, and I think I, it's, it's actually really interesting because you, you, when you start to break down like why that is, I mean, certainly there's just a, hey, it's the tool we know. But I think it also speaks to the fact that in many ways, it's, it's been this really flexible way for marketers to both be sort of builders like they use spreadsheets as a way to sort of model what they think is possible you know mm -hmm. from an operational perspective you know it's been one of the few tools people have been able to use to um uh yeah just really be able all right this is what i'm tracking and this is how i want it to relate to this other thing and this is the calculation um and those are all like really powerful in fact these are things that 
are so important to marketing, but they don't always get celebrated uh, because it's not the sexy campaign. It is the mechanics behind the scene that allows the sexy campaign to actually happen. Um, but that being said, it's like, I think this is one of the areas where there's enormous opportunity for disruption, you know, because while Excel has been, you know, incredibly useful to us, I also think yeah, everyone uses like, well, you know, yeah, it is kind of a pain. And no, this is this is not the most, uh, you know, perfect nirvana <laughs> I could imagine for uh, right. how to run these aspects of my marketing board. Right. Well, I mean, for better, or for worse, it is the, it's the universal MarTech training wheels, right? Like start with a spreadsheet and you start to get the hang of where you go from. Where, where do you go next with your MarTech investments? Um, the thing that that I find so puzzling is that while the activation side of MarTech, right? How do you actually reach your buyers? How do you track what they do? How do you serve up great content to them? How do you put them on journeys? How do you get them to convert? How do you, all the things that, you know, the vast majority of those 10,000 applications, while there's been so much investment on that side, the actual operations of marketing, right? Where, where you do planning, where you do budgeting, where you plan your projects and work and programs, um, that is, com it's still completely dominated by spreadsheets. And then maybe to a lesser extent, PowerPoints. I mean, everyone has a plan that starts on a spreadsheet, ends up in a PowerPoint so it can present it to a board and an executive team and then the leadership team and cascaded. But they don't, there, there doesn't, still doesn't seem to be this universal system of record for getting those things out of spreadsheets and PowerPoints into like some workbench. Right, some some yeah. living, breathing, continuous planning system. I'm just curious, as as an observer of this space, what is there a reason for that? Like, how does that how did that come to be? Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's one of these things. Um, marketers have just had a ton to like learn. I mean, like just the the amount of change, uh, you know, that marketers are faced. I, I I wasn't kidding about saying marketing is an Olympic sport. I mean, the I cannot think of any other profession that over the past 20 years has had the incredible breadth and depth of change uh, that marketing has. I mean, lots of professions, lots of change. Marketing, mm -hmm. just epic change on every single dimension. Uh, and this, as it turns out, is like really hard, you know, and it's a ton of learning and it's a ton of adaptation, you know. And so I think out of all the various things that marketers had to, you know, like learn and figure out and adapt to, you know, uh, sort of the internal ops that they were managing with spreadsheets was like, all right, well, we can kind of get by with this for now, um, you know, so it wasn't necessarily as pressing, uh, you know, but I guess here's the reality is one of the biggest changes to marketing has been this multiplication of activities and channels yeah. and touch points, you know, and again, all of those touch points, all of those customer facing experiences, at the end of the day, the, the customer facing piece of that is a relatively thin veneer, you know, on top of what is, you know, incredibly complex, uh, you know, set of operational capabilities to deliver that. You know, and I think you now really do see that like, okay, yes, we've we figured out what we want to do. We even figured out, you know, how we want to do it, you know, but wow, the process of actually managing this from an operations perspective, oh my goodness, like we are straining under the weight, uh, you know, of, uh, yeah, just the limitations of, you know, what Excel does. And so I do, I, I do think like the timing is um, quite right, uh, you know, for people to, have a better way of thinking right. about, uh, hey, you know, how could I actually harness this technology thing to like make my life easier? <laughs> yeah, I, I, exactly. I mean, is it possible you think that despite all these, uh, you know, transformative things that have happened over the last 20 years, you know, the rise of marketing operations, if you will, or, you know, RevOps or whatever, whatever you want to call it, the rise of that, is it possible that the sheer complexity of the tech stack of the integrations and the flows and managing all those, getting systems to talk to one another, be able to measure the outcomes, be able to orchestrate over all these channels is like, it's caused marketing ops to get kind of stuck in the weeds. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that as a possibility where um, it's just not possible to get out of tactical configuration of the systems themselves and level up to a, a place where, you know, you're actually in, in a marketing operations role, the eyes and the ears of the CMO. Like, 
What is our strategy? How is it playing out? Are we being successful? Do we need to pivot? What do we need to change? And like the systems inform that, those, those, those insights, but instead we're kind of in a place where marketing ops is just overwhelmed with keeping up with the machine. Yeah, and I, I'm sure any marketing ops person who's listening to us now here uh, would be nodding their head vigorously uh, that, yeah, this is not a hypothetical yeah. <laughs> situation. Like, this is for almost all marketing ops people I know, like, their life right now. I mean, it is an incredibly complex, uh, you know, job that they're running right now. And I think the recognition is certainly that, like, okay, yes, there's enormous value to managing and executing that complexity but also being at the heart of that complexity, the heart of like everything that's flowing in and out of, you know, the marketing organization, the potential for like insight and, you know, strategic contribution from that is enormous. And again, like a lot of marketing ops leaders, I mean, they are so well poised to do that. Um, you know, but I think your, your, your instincts here are right that, you know, what, what's holding them back, you know, is not that there isn't theoretically the enormous leverage there or that, you know, they don't have, you know, the capabilities to do it, you know, personally, it's just more that like, wow, all the other responsibilities, you know, and right. operational management that they've got going right now uh, is just um, a, a tremendous weight, you know, on their time. And so, uh, I definitely think that, yeah, again, it just goes back to what we were chatting here around, you know, Excel too, the ability to just steadily, uh, you know, like improve the actual operational technology uh, yeah. marketing would be incredible. Um, I think that's a, I think that's a great segue into you talked about, you know, category creation or an idea for people to, to lock on to. And um, I, I think that that would be, you, you and I have been talking for a while about maybe uh a new way to think about the operational side of marketing. Um, this concept of what we're calling marketing business acceleration. Yeah, I'd love to, uh, I mean, I know you've shared a bit of this with me, but yeah, we'd love to bring that back into this conversation of, um, you know, I kind of feel like there was, uh, you know, in earlier stages of marketing's evolution, you know, we started to talk about things like, you know, marketing resource management um, and some of these capabilities in that context. But yeah, sort of the scope of like what's actually possible now. It's just very different. Um, and uh, yeah, I think some of uh, the way uh, you and your team have been thinking about this marketing business acceleration is, is, is pretty cool. But maybe we should start like from your perspective, what is marketing business acceleration? Well, uh, I'm very pleased to tell you, we don't consider it like a product category. We're not gonna, I'm not going to come appeal to you to draw, you know, gerrymander a new <laughs> like category and call it marketing business acceleration. The, it, the notion is pretty straightforward. You know, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, when, you know, I, I was actually running marketing operations, we were consumed with demand generation and concepts around that. And suddenly this framework appeared that came out of serious decisions called the demand waterfall, right? This notion that, which by the way, since then it's gone through so many changes, but this notion that, you know, there is a system to cultivating leads that then can be converted into opportunities and work by sales. And, you know, there are these different stages and there are natural uh, conversion rates that you can benchmark for, you know, it's, it gave marketers something to, you know, like to, to hold on to. Okay, there's a system here. I follow this system. I can see how I'm doing benchmark against myself and then it's against others. Um, and then after that came, you know, the notion of flipping that funnel and there's account-based marketing and those people talking about intent-based stuff. And, uh, and they, you know, so there are all these frameworks on the activation side of the house. Um, but there aren't a ton of these quote unquote frameworks or operating models on the operational side of the house. How do you actually run marketing, right? There is a business strategy. The business strategy has an, an operating plan that gets cascaded into a, a marketing strategy, which then has a plan with a set of goals that then becomes programs and tactics. It gets, you know, cascaded to teams and then there's dollars aligned to those things and those need to be tracked and then there's yeah then there's work streams and projects and yeah that there, there's not there doesn't seem to be an agreed upon model for that and we think that we personally think that's a gap and that that gap needs to be filled that's the idea behind this marketing business acceleration 
What's fascinating because like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think your insight here that like, you know, sort of the demand generation, activation, acquisition, like, yeah, you know, that's probably the piece of, you know, uh, the post-digital transformation marketing that, you know, we've got our arms around the most. Um, but it's also, for the most part, those things, you know, are largely entirely in marketing's domain. Like we know that what that work is, we know the scope of it. It does feel like when you start looking at the operational management side uh, of marketing, um, it's not even necessarily as clear to people like, what are the components, you know, of that? Like, you know, um, you know, it's not just the customer side of things. It is is very much like internally, like, you know, is it like, you know, the planning, you know, what with finance, projects, people um, like, do you see that framework like sort of pulling all those things together? I, I do. And I think that's pretty expansive, that side of it, but it's not typically thought about. Like when people think about categories of MarTech, they don't think about planning and budgeting and, you know, maybe project management, et cetera. But it is all those things. You might even go as far as to say, well, a huge part of marketing, given all these changes, is talent acquisition, right? And actually, how do you invest and give people the skills that they need to actually learn all these concepts? So it's all the things you need, the ingredients you need to be able to run a campaign that gets activated through this really complex, sophisticated MarTech stack. And for me, that definitely is at least the basics of planning, financial management, work management, program management. And so to some extent, I do think around um, you know, assets that you have or content that you have, the, the fuel of campaigns, all of those things need to be pulled together into a system you know and, th and that system like many systems like it should have a kind of a maturity framework right where do you start where's the basics what's step one what's step two what's step three how do you systematically mature how you run the business of marketing such that you can get to you know, uh, uh, some state of some excellence or maturity such that you're, you know, you're running marketing like a business with natural inputs and outputs that you can report on it using financial language or at least language that business owners understand versus so they don't have to become experts in marketing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's a very powerful angle to this too, because um, yeah, it, it, again, we we're talking earlier about the landscape, like you know, in some ways, it's this artifact that gives us some hint to like the scope of change that's happening in marketing. Uh, right. Is I feel like when you think about like the operating model of marketing, again, this is another one of these things that we know is changing, and it's like huge in scope, but I almost feel like the the crystallizing version of that is what are the questions you as the CMO are going to be asked by the board, are going to be asked by the CEO, you know, because very often like this gets out of a whole bunch of the, you know, uh, details of, oh, well, this particular campaign and, you know, this, uh, oh, yeah. you know, brand position and yeah, this is how we're doing this demand, you know, effort to like, no, no, the questions you're going to get from the board and the CEO are going to be different what are those questions and is this new operating model these new capabilities can they help you answer those questions better yeah I, 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 that's exactly the way i think about it because as soon as you said what questions are you going to get from the ceo it really depends on the ceo you have scott <laughs> i have been asked questions about a certain color and is that the right word or should it be this word but uh just putting those aside right now <laughs> the question the questions the hardest questions you get asked are the questions that come directly from, frankly, the ownership of the company, which says, you know, if I were to double your program spend, what type of growth can you engineer with that? Mm. Or if our growth rate is going to be X percent, X percent, X percent, what do you need in terms of resources? And how do you think about what the ratio of marketing budget to revenue is? You know, is it is that based on the steepness of the curve? Is that based, you know? Like there's those types of questions or even better yet. Okay, you've demonstrated that you can enter one market. We want to enter a new market. There's a new opportunity there. How do you think about resourcing that business strategy from a marketing standpoint? Those are really challenging questions yeah. to answer. And they're 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 not they're not answers I can get by you know picking out any of those tools or MarTech applications on the execution side or the activation side and go digging around looking for answers. I just can't get answers there. 
Um, it's fascinating. I feel like, uh, you know, so much of the talk over like, you know, the past 10, 15 years in marketing from a technology perspective has been like, oh, we want the 360 degree view of the customer, which right. I agree. That's a, a, a good thing to have. Um, it's almost like this is like, okay, how do I get the 360 degree view of my marketing org and my actual like, you know, operational execution of yeah, how marketing runs. Right. Yeah, exactly. So why, you know, why invest in this particular headcount versus this, this particular headcount? What's a, and in order to, I mean, to answer those questions, you know, you kind of almost have this, you have to have this kind of abstraction layer above the tech stack that allows you to pull performance data and compare it against investment data. Mm -hmm. Like everyone talks about getting ROI, but it's, it's not very often where anybody pulls the eye into the equation. You know, they say, well, we uh, did this trade show and look at all this pipeline we got from it. You know, there's not like a true ROI at a macro level for marketing. And, and uh, I, I think that that should be a very uh, straightforward question to answer for marketing executives, um, which means you need to tie your investments to your plans, to your work streams, to the outcomes and the performance data you get out of this activation this MarTech stack. <clears throat> Do you think uh, like a lot of marketers out there are maybe scared isn't the right word, but like, yeah, apprehensive of like, they just haven't really been able to do that very effectively in the past. Like, you know, is, is, is there just some concern of like, can I do this? Like, how, how do I get my arms around this? You know, what would be your answer to that? Um, I think that uh, the worst answer you could possibly give is, oh, well, this is all new. This is a whole new thing we're going to do. Totally different. You're going to change it. The world changes now. Like marketers simply don't want to hear that everything changes at some amount. It's a terrible value proposition because it's a constant state of change. And I, I have a different view. I view that like if you've been on this journey for the last 10, 20 years, um, you know that we've just scratched the surface. And you also know that the capabilities that are being offered to you that are available in the marketplace change dramatically in a very short span of time. You know, like customer data platforms weren't even really talked about like five years ago and you have all this. Um, so uh, I guess the best way to put it is we, I, I think that this appeals to marketers and particularly marketing operations folks, natural curiosity to want to connect these systems together and be able to tie all of the performance data that you're getting out of these different systems to the to the, the operational data. You know, planning, your financial management, your costs behind the structure, where your investments are flowing to, et cetera. It's, it's not that far of a leap to try and get to these ROI scenarios. You know, it's just a natural, I think it's a natural evolution. It makes sense. So, you know, when we started uh, chatting about this, uh, you know, one of my questions was like, okay, well, you know, in previous incarnations, you know, people had talked about this category of market resource management, MRM, yeah. uh, you know, as a set of tools to, you know, help achieve this. Um, it de definitely feels like there's, there, there, there's evolution in thinking about just, you know, how people think about that. But I guess how similar or different is, you know, this marketing business acceleration uh, concept, you know, from what, Historically, we thought of as MRM. Ah, that's really good. I think of MRM is still it's it's, it's a product category for sure, um, and I think that the the notion of marketing business acceleration is it's a uh, it's an operating model, right? It's a state of maturity. It's how you use MRM products in con in conjunction with other products to mature how you operate as a marketing organization. So I don't see uh, marketing business acceleration as really a product category or product at all. It's just, it's, like I said, a state of maturity. MRM systems, just because you asked about them specifically, they've been around a long time. I don't think it's a category that has necessarily caught fire. And why is that? Because number one, it just, it focuses on efficiency. The first message around marketing resource management was one of efficiency. You know, how can you efficiently use your assets and, and, and your content and, and everything else? And, yeah, I think that's important. And of course that will grow in importance in the coming, in the coming months if things are going the way we're, we think they're going right now with the economy, you do need to be efficient, but that's not what appeals to marketers. Marketers wanna be effective, right? They, they want to 
not just do their marketing better. They want to do better marketing. That's what you're known for. It's what you build your career on. That's what you aspire to. And so I, I don't think MRM really spoke to effectiveness as much as it should have. That's why this notion of marketing business acceleration out of all of those three words, the one that rings most interesting to me, it's accelerate because yeah. trying to get to market fast is the name of the game to beat the competition, to meet the expectations of the consumer, the buyer, where they are, take advantages of new opportunities or overcome you know, disruptions. We've all seen a lot of that recently and speed is of the essence in today's day and age. Yeah, I think it, I think I think that's a significant difference between MRM and marketing business acceleration. It makes a ton of sense to me. Um, well, can we maybe pry down just uh, to the next level on yeah, marketing uh, business acceleration? Um, the that groovy new logo, uh, you know, above your shoulder there uh, for UpTempo. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about uh, yeah, what you're doing here with UpTempo. Oh, you, so you want to totally pivot from data-driven marketing to highly subjective marketing? <laughs> and branding? <laughs> what is it? All politics is local? <laughs> that's right, Scott. Yeah, thanks for asking. So Uptempo, that's right. Uptempo, we uh, recently rebranded to Uptempo, uh, actually renamed the entire company. Again, the company was a, was a merger of three companies. Brandmaker, which is uh, an MRM player. Uh, primarily European-based, very focused on big brands, B2C type organizations, Alacadia. I think many B2B marketers are familiar with Alacadia, an expert in financial management and, and, and budgeting, served primarily B2B companies, a lot of high-tech customers, and then Hivedyne, an innovative company that really focused on marketing performance management, uh, focused attribution models, et cetera. So you kind of bring those three mm -hmm. together and we just wanted to, unify them under a common name and have a name that spoke to some of what I was just talking about. You know, marketers desire to move a little faster, to, to kick it up a notch and thus the up-tempo uh, name and brand. All right, well, I'm not pandering to you. I, uh, I see a lot of MarTech names. Um, up-tempo is a phenomenal name. I love it, very catchy, very memorable. And yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it definitely speaks to exactly, you know, that that, that acceleration yeah, <laughs> keyword that you right. were underlining there. Um, that's right. It was also super fascinating to me, you know, uh, yeah, the three companies that came together uh, in forming this is, uh, yeah, it just, it, it really, while each one of those, you know, were, were, were strong, uh, you know, uh, companies and products, you know, in their own right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's sort of stepping back and seeing those as pieces of a larger puzzle uh, it's been super exciting. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I can see you can imagine this as like, yeah, the galvanizing idea. Um, if there's another side to like, oh, we, we need a galvanizing idea and marketing business acceleration uh, sure seems like a fantastic one. Uh, usually the other thing we have on that is like, okay, well, what's, who's the enemy? What's the enemy? What are the thing that we're going up, uh, you know, against? Who is or what is Uptempo's enemy? It's a, it's a great question. So, you know, it's funny, we started off this conversation talking about spreadsheets and I'd be crazy to make spreadsheets the enemy. But I think the, the, the enemy very much is these dis disconnected processes, right? It's somehow in the profession of marketing, we've just got used to um, not being able to have visibility over how marketing operates, right? Like it's just, you know, we go through this planning process and then, like I said, we toss around some PowerPoints and we're all agreed. And, but there is no system of record for a continuously evolving plan, even though we need, we need a system for that. And the same thing for, for, you know, for budgeting. It, it's just, it's a simply astounding to me that we talk to some of the biggest brands in the world that literally operate on not just hundreds of spreadsheets, sometimes thousands of spreadsheets and SharePoint sites and collaboration tools and no nobody has one view of something as simple as you know the financial management of the entire global marketing organization it, it's just crazy to me um and if if you have no single system of record to even view something as as you know profoundly important as that how the heck do you pivot when when it comes time to change how do you change you know i was reading a i was reading this uh this review of a, a customer that we were we were engaged with, and the CMO kind of uses analogy of 
listen, we can pivot, but when, when we pivot, it's like trying to steer a freight ship, like a freighter ship with your with using your arm as the propeller. It takes a long time to turn that thing. You know, so it's like there's no notion of agility at all. Uh, and so it, the enemy really is this, uh, this state of being where we rely on stuff that's disconnected with the lack of visibility, the lack of velocity and the lack of agility that, and the operational side of marketing. That's, that's a very vivid metaphor uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the freighter ship and yeah. <laughs> trying to use a kickboard. Uh, yeah, um, exactly. Well, I think, you know, maybe one last thought on this too is, uh, you know, again, the, the, the concept, um, you know, like really uh, the galvanizing idea. Yeah. What is the thing that, you know, you're, you're conquering over uh, the old uh, with the new, um, but maybe just to close a bit, I'd love your thoughts on the who, um, because I feel like marketing ops, I, I believe two statements are true. One is um, I think they hold the keys to the universe in like how marketing is actually, you know, performing uh, today. Uh, but two, I think they're generally underrecognized and underappreciated, uh, you know, for their critical role that they play. And to be honest, while many marketing ops folks, you know, have been the champions of, you know, my world in MarTech, um, which is great and it's awesome. You know, again, MarTech, MarTech is not business results. MarTech is one piece of an equation, you know, of how we deliver, uh, you know, on what the business needs from us, you know. And so while I'm happy to have marketing ops people be the champions of MarTech, I think they've got like a higher calling, you know, uh, in their role. And it sure does seem like, uh, yeah, where you're headed here with marketing business acceleration uh, is perhaps the way to rally them to, uh, yeah, uh, that higher calling. I, th I think it's one way to rally them. I, there's a number of ways, but I, I completely agree with you that um, the goal is to rally marketing operations professionals to a higher calling. And we think, I, I, I mean, we see that quite often. We will engage with marketing operations folks. And then sometimes people come into conversations that, you know, they have titles like chief of staff to the CMO, in the office of the CMO, right? Or chief of staff of marketing. And they actually are very operationally focused and they're in touch with marketing ops, but they're operating in a little bit of a higher plane, you know, much more of a strategic plane. Like I said, being that the eyes and ears of the CMO who has a real challenge making sure that, you know, the whole plan they rolled out suddenly didn't dissolve among the widely distributed teams on different systems. Um, and so I do think marketing ops will evolve. I think they'll, it'll diversify into a much more strategic level versus kind of a mark, like, a MarTech operational level. Um, and that's just fine because, you know, if, if you say software ate the world and every every company is really a software company, then it's not that hard of a stretch, Scott, to imagine that every marketing function is really a marketing operations function at <laughs> its heart, right? Like that, it's not that hard. If, if marketing is really data-driven and marketing is really triggered by, uh, you know, events and, and, and most of marketing is going digital and all that's flowing through a MarTech stack. It's not really hard to see how marketing operations is the, um, the up and coming function in modern marketing departments. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and I'm quite sure our uh, listeners uh, from the marketing operations uh, community are sharing like, are yes, you, I feel I seen. <laughs> uh, and it is really, truly a great, Great opportunity. Uh, ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Listen, I, I will not take up more of your time. This has been a great conversation. I feel like we, as per usual, covered a ton of ground in the conversation, uh, Scott. So thank you. Thank you for your observations and for your time today. I greatly appreciate it. Awesome. Always love chatting with you, Jim. Uh, best of luck with uh, Up Tempo. Love the name. Love the mission. Uh, can't wait to see where you go. Great. Thank you.